Now Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram, Aram, Aram who was a great man in the, great, in the sight of his master and highly regarded, because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Now bands of raiders from Aram had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, If only my master would see the prophet who was in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl of Israel had said. By all means go, the king of Aram replied. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten sets of clothing. The letter that he sent, that he took, to the king of Israel read, With this letter I am sending my servant Naaman to you, so that you may cure him of his leprosy. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me. When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me, and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went to his horses, with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent the messenger to him and said, Go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored with you, and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought he would surely come out and sit with me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot, and cure me of my leprosy. Are not the Albana and Farfar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. Naaman's servants went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you have not have done it? How much time then, when he tells you, wash and be cleansed, uh, how much more then? Uh, so he went and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, as the man of God had told him, and his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. Then Naaman went with all his attendants back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, Now I know that there is a God in all, no God in all the world except in Israel. So please accept a gift from your servant. The prophet answered, As surely as the Lord lives, whom I serve, I will not accept a thing. Even though Naaman urged him, he refused. Good morning. Uh, this coming Wednesday, uh, uh, we have Taekwon Dudley, who's a police officer in Hartford. Uh, he's going to do a presentation on security. So if you want to be a part of a special class, a special presentation, that'll be this coming Wednesday at 7 o'clock. And uh, come and be a part of that. And, and I think it'll, it'll be worth your while to come and, and do that. It's also summertime. And we're going to do our summer schedule. The second Sunday of every month is fellowship dinner. Uh, it's been our custom the last few years to have hamburgers and hot dogs outside. And so the second Sunday of June, we'll be grilling hamburgers and hot dogs. Um, also, there's a possibility that uh, some of the people I work with at Youth Challenge from Hartford will be visiting with us. And they'll be sharing the fellowship with us. And so uh, it'll be special for them to get to worship here. And, uh, and so uh, they may, we may have another 20 people maybe in, on that particular Sunday. So uh, keep that in mind. Be making plans about bringing a dish and uh, I'll do, meet grill masters and that sort of thing uh, to volunteer. So we'll do that for the summer months. So be looking forward to that. Recently, Julie and I watched this movie. It's called The 33. And it's about, in 2010, you remember when there was uh, some miners in Chile? And they were trapped for 69 days. And it got global attention. Uh, and uh, you can only imagine what that was like. I can't even imagine. I was in Mammoth Cave one time in Kentucky, and they shut the lights off. I never experienced that kind of blackness before. You could almost touch the blackness. So imagine being thousands of feet under the earth and, and this, there's a rock that collapsed and they said it was twice the size of the Empire State Building. And so it came down and they were just, they said, what are we going to do? They, they felt, a newspaper said there was only a 2% chance of them getting out. Desperation? You can only imagine the desperation. 
And this movie, you can, it's out now, you can get it and rent it. We, we watched it a couple days ago. There was a book also written about this called Deep Down Dark. That's an appropriate title. And the cool thing about the book, it's better than the movie, uh, in that it goes to uh, each of, the, of those uh, men, those 33 men, and they get their stories. And so I like that part the best because I found out from that, that reference that there was a man there by the name Jose who was, they called him the pastor. So imagine you're, you're, you're trapped. You, don't, you doubt if you're going to get out. But there's a guy there that knows something about God. They start asking him, what shall we do? And he says, we need to get down on our knees and pray. And they got down on their knees and they prayed. And then they said, well, what can we do next? And he says, we need to repent of our sins. There was a revival that broke out. Now, you know there would be, right? Because God, God uses those de desperate times to break us down. And that's whenever our eyes are wide open. Agreed? That when we're in those desperate spots, that's whenever we start to look up. And these men, there's a revival that happened underneath the earth. And so... Some of them started confessing that, you know, I'm an alcoholic, I've destroyed my family, uh, you know, I've been unfaithful to my wife. And, and they just, these 33 men start pouring out their soul to God. There was a 2% chance of getting out. The, as you watch this movie, if you do rent it, uh, it says that there were several attempts to drill down and they missed them. And they could even hear the drilling, but they realized the drill missed them. But finally, there was a, a team from America that drilled down and they were able to get to the men. And they were able to put food and water through a small opening in the earth and drop the food and water down to these miners. But even then, it took several weeks after that for them to come up with a solution to get them out. But once that, that tube came down and they got food and water, something changed. And the change was is that we're not in despair anymore. Eventually, they'll figure this out and we'll get out. And then they sent down newspapers and they realized that they had become celebrities. And there was some money to be made. Guess what they stopped doing? They stopped praying. They stopped worshiping. Because they're no longer in despair. Isn't that sad that we do that? That at times, whenever we just feel the pressure upon us, that we cry out to God, but when things are wonderful, we forget. And so, desperation becomes a gift sometimes. We may not think it's a gift, especially when we're living it. And so, so there's some bad news to this. But the good news is, is that God can use it to wake us up. And he can turn that despair and that desperation until a time where we let God in and let him speak. So desperation is a gift that nobody wants but all of us need. And so, uh, I don't know. Some of you probably are in despair now. I know there's people in this room that have cancer. You don't know. You don't know what's going to happen. Some of you could be sitting right here and having all kinds of fa family problems. You could have a child that's rebellious. That you're here in worship, but your child's not here in worship. And only as a parent you know what that feels like. Whenever you so desperately want your child here, worshiping God with you, but your child maybe is a, re a rebel and rejecting it. The reason I bring this up is that it's possible that God can give you a peace that passes all understanding. That he comes to you in those bleak moments with a presence and with his presence with the Holy Spirit that you won't experience otherwise. And I like, that's why I like this story in 2 Kings chapter 5. We see a desperate man. His man the man's name is, is, is Naaman. And, and I see that he kind of goes through some stages of desperation. The first stage is an awareness of a need. Chapter 5, verse 1 says, Now Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. 
He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. And that's kind of interesting because Aram was an enemy of Israel. This is not talking about Jewish king. It's talking about Assyria. Aram is Assyria. Isn't it interesting that God used Assyria against Israel and it says God's hand was with this man? I find that interesting. But as you read the Old Testament, that's exactly what happened. That God used a foreign army to accomplish his will. Praise God, right? What if Trump becomes president? What if the Democrats become president? Really? It doesn't matter? God's on the throne? God knows. He knows what's going to happen. He knows who's going to be elected next. He sets up kings and removes kings, the Bible says. Daniel chapter 2. God uses the enemies of Israel to accomplish his purpose. Praise God. Right? That God will work in these difficult, crazy situations. And he, he's, he's the puppeteer. And so God can use these dreadful situations to bring him glory. And it could be a gift. Naaman, Naaman's got some things going on for him. He's a commander. That gave him celebrity status. You're going to see that this man is wealthy. He's going to give, offer 150 pounds of gold to the prophet. Wouldn't you like to have 150 pounds of gold? I would. Like Ken said, that's probably not enough. But we would still want it, right? We would want it. And so here you've got this man. He's, he's highly regarded. He's a valiant soldier. But he gets up one day and he notices a small part of skin that looks funny. Maybe it's white. Maybe it's scratchy. And he starts itching it. And he's saying, oh, that's not good. A few more weeks go by, and the patch of skin gets bigger. And finally, it starts going up the arm or his leg or on his neck or his chest. And you're, you're in the mirror looking. And you know what he might be thinking? I'm sure he thought it. Leprosy. Leprosy. Back then, there was no cure. Once you got leprosy in those days, that meant you were going to die. That man would be in despair, right? There was no cure in those days. And so here you've got this man. He's got a lot of things going for him. He's got money. He's got, he's got celebrity status. He's, he's highly regarded. He's a valiant soldier. But he's sick. He's sick. And so what does he do? Well, the story says there's a slave girl. A slave girl. That means that this guy, who is a soldier who has leprosy, helped create some of her despair. She was a Jewish woman who probably, as a young girl, thought, I'm going to get marry me a nice Jewish boy and have a whole bunch of Jewish children, you know? But no, things changed. That an army from the north, the Syrian army, came down and somehow captured her, and now she is a slave in this foreign place. And then she finds out that Naaman, who is a commander, maybe even responsible for her family to be taken away, has leprosy. What would some of you think? Uh, you're getting what you deserve, right? I have no sympathy for you, you're the enemy. That's not what I read in this story. And so that leads to a second degree of desperation, an openness to godly counsel from others. First there's a need, then there's an openness for help. Verse 2, now bands of raiders from Aram had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel. And she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, if only my master would see the prophet who was in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. The prophet's name was Elisha. 
And so here you, as I read First and Second Kings, it's really not so much about the history of these kings. <coughs> Basically, First and Second Kings tell you that most of the kings were bad. There were only two of them that were good. It, it's talking about how good and bad leaders rule God's people. That's what it talks about. That's also a good lesson for America, that we have good presidents, bad presidents. How does that all fit in? That we need to be worshiping God during all of that? Who's on the throne? And so that's what I read in, the, in Kings, is that it's talking about good kings, bad kings. There's a bad king now ruling. And so God has allowed this foreign army to come in and to punish the Israelites. But there's a prophet telling the people, don't get focused on all of that. Focus on God. And that was Elijah's responsibility. And so in times like this, there's a tug of war that happens with us. I've had people say, well, I've got cancer, but I don't want the church to know. Oh, my goodness. Tell us. We need to pray. Amen? We need to pray, but we have this tug of war, almost ambivalence that goes on. Like, I've got this, this terrible thing, but I don't want anybody to know. Why do we do that? That I've got all this junk going on, and I've got all this pain, and I've got all this desperation, but I don't want anyone to know. I like this guy. He starts looking for help. You know, there's people in this room that have gone through a bunch of stuff. And sometimes they can give you some good counsel. You could be going through something, but if you keep it quiet, you know what? I don't get it. I don't know. Ralph doesn't know. The deacons don't know. Other people sitting in the pew chairs with you don't know, unless you let us know. There could be people in this room that could help you. Here you have a man in a desperate situation. He seeks out some godly counsel from a foreigner, a slave girl, who says, man, you need to go listen, go see the prophet. That's a good lesson for us. My brother and sister, there could be a co-worker that's having family problems. There could be a neighbor who's, who's going through some financial issues. We need to have our antenna up and listen. This young girl, who's a slave girl, is listening to a desperate situation and she gets involved. She reaches out and tries to help this person. Somebody could be going through a divorce, have financial issues, family issues. They need to have friends. They need to have somebody that will listen. And so, Naaman, he goes to his king and he says, look, can you write me a letter? And the king says, yes, I'll write you a letter. And he writes a letter to the king of Israel, and he basically says to the king of Israel, I want you to heal my commander. <laughs> That'd be like you writing me a letter saying, I want you to heal my family member. I can't do it. I can't do it. I don't have any authority. I don't have any power to do that sort of thing. So don't write me the letter. Right? But the king writes a letter for Naaman and sends it with him. Not only that, he, he takes with him 750 pounds of silver and 150 pounds of gold. I'll get back to that in a moment. I had to go online and figure out how much that was worth today, right? But even back then, 150 pounds of gold, that'd be awesome, right? So it tells you something about Naaman is that he was a mighty man, so much that the king would give him a whole bunch of money to try to take care of him. And so he goes to the king, and the king says, I don't know what to do. They end up getting Elijah's address. And first, Second Kings 5 verse 9 says, So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elijah's house. Can you imagine what that looked like? It would be maybe a stretch limousine. You know, you got that entourage. That you've got a very wealthy man. He's got 150 pounds of gold and 750 pounds of silver somewhere. And he's carrying it with him. And so they get up to Elijah's door. Right? This is interesting. There's a third degree of desperation, a willingness to ask for help from others. And so... Uh, they get at the Naaman's door. Finally, he says, I've got to go see this prophet. 
Why is it that we're so reluctant to ask for help? Many years ago, when Julie and I were first married, I was 20 years old. And I had hot rods. I had a 69 Roadrunner, a 57 Chevy, a 65 Mustang, and I'd blow the engine up, put an engine in, blow the transmission up, put a transmission in. And, but we were poor, and we were newly, newly married. And so I went to my brother-in-law and said, can I use your tent? And he had a tent. Back then, the poles weren't connected together. They were all disconnected. And so uh, he says, do you want me to set it up for you to show you how to do it? And I'm saying, I got this. You know? I said, I can take a motor out, put it back in. I can take a transmission out, put it back in. I can put up a tent. So we drive from Ohio to Indiana to go camping. We get to this nice lake, and there's, there's camper trailers, and there's nice tents. And so Julie and I start setting up the tent. I start putting those poles together to say, I don't know what I'm doing. I should have let it show me how to put those bins and tubes and everything and hook them in the right place because they're different lengths and there's elbows and twists. And so I started putting those together and I couldn't figure it out. You remember us doing that? It was sad. It looked like a teepee. All right? And here we got campers around us and people with those nice tents and I've got this something stuck out there. I was so embarrassed. We stayed one night and we went home. And you know what I'm thinking? I'm thinking we don't have all the parts to this tent. He left something out. I went home the next day. Denny had that thing all set up. And he says, everything was right there, Jim. But so you see, I didn't want to ask for help. And so that's, that's the funny thing about desperation. You can be in this desperate situation and it's, you're feeling all this pressure, but you're not telling anybody. You're not seeking out others to help you. Well, Naaman finally gets around to it. And verse 10 says, Elijah sent a messenger to say to him. Now that's interesting. The prophet didn't even go out. He sent his intern. And then he sends the intern out. Here you've got this entourage, right? The stretch limo, 750 pounds of silver, 150 pounds of gold. You got all these clothes. You got a letter from the king. And the prophet sends out his intern. Go wash yourself seven times. The intern's name is Gehazi. We'll find out later. Go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan and your flesh will be restored and you will be cleansed. Now imagine, Naaman has got all this money. He, he's a celebrity. He's got this entourage. He's got all this gold, all these silver, all these clothes. He goes to the prophet and the prophet won't even come out and talk to him. He won't even come out. Verse 11. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of his God, wave his hand over the spot, and cure me of leprosy. What is he wanting? He's wanting a show. He says, I'm a big man. You know who I am? I, look at all this gold. Look at all this silver. Look at my entourage. And you won't even come out? And then you tell me to go dip in the dirty Jordan River? Come on! Come on! What does he have? Pride. Pride. Another problem, he's ticked. He's angry. He's embarrassed. That you're not treating me with the respect I deserve. And the third thing is unbelief. The Jordan? It's dirty. The rivers back in my place are much nicer. This is what happened. Verse 13, Naaman's servants went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? Stop doubting and believe. Stop doubting. And the guy is struggling with belief here. He says seven times of George. Have you ever seen anybody ever dip seven times and cured of leprosy? No. There was no test case. There was no case study. There was nothing except God telling him, this is what I want you to do. So the fourth degree, 
folks, very important, a readiness to obey God. You can be in a bad spot, but God is there trying to help you to trust Him. Verse 14, so he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times. As the man of God had told him, and his flesh was restored, and it became clean like that of a young boy. Praise God, right? We worship that God today. That same God that could take somebody with leprosy and turn them into having a baby skin. Simply because the man was willing to obey. God requires total obedience. When God tells you to do something, you need to do it. And we struggle with that. We say, ah. Oh. You know, the Jordan River for many people today is baptism. They just don't get it. They don't see it. And they say, what? What is that? I got to do that? That's exactly what this guy is doing. He, he says, God says through the prophet, go dip yourself seven times in the Jordan River. And he says, what? Doesn't make sense to me. It's too simple. But he did, and he was blessed because he obeyed. Then Naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, Now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. So please accept a gift from your servant. You want to know how many 150 pounds of gold would be today in today's market? One billion. Nine hundred million dollars. Wow, huh? Seven hundred and fifty pounds of silver, not as much. It'd be today would be hundred and seventy seven thousand dollars. Back then it still was a lot of money, you get that? Naaman has a whole bunch of gold and a whole bunch of silver. And he goes to the prophet and he says, I want to give it to you. What preacher today would turn that down? All right? I'm looking for a pension, right? I mean, and, but the amazing thing is that the prophet would not accept it. Is God trying to teach you something? He's trying to teach you something. This is something that can't be bought. It's a gift. Your salvation is a gift, and you can't buy it. You don't earn it. You don't deserve it. You are sick and you need help. And that's what you need to feel if you don't have Jesus. You need to feel some desperation. For the wages of sin is death. All right? And if we are simply, really, the cross? And isn't it true today? For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. Right? To this day. Jesus? I don't need it, people will say. Most of America don't feel they need it. How foolish. All right? But if we'll just believe in the simple things, and that's really the lesson for us. That's the hook in this lesson. How, how can we be cleansed? Well, Jesus will say, I, I told you that you will die in your sins. If you do not believe, that I'm He, you will indeed die in your sins. Is that a life and death statement? That you have to believe that Jesus Christ is who He claims to be, the Son of God and your Savior. There's no hope without it. He will say, I tell you no, but unless you repent, you too will perish. Another life or again death statement. That you have to repent, you have to change the way you live. You can't just accept Jesus and keep on living in the world. You have to turn away from that. Jesus will say, whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. You need to go public and say, Jesus is my Savior. You need to be willing to confess his name. Jesus goes on to say, these are all words of Jesus. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Oh, there's that water again. There's that water again. Come on. It's just water. Let me tell you, you can be baptized in the Naugatuck River, and there's power in that. Amen. All right? You may think, uh-uh. Yeah, there's power in that. Jesus can wash your sins away, even in the Naugatuck River. Right? 
Look at what Peter says. To those who were disobedient long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah, while the ark was being built, in it only eight people in all were saved through what? Oh, water again? Water again? Naaman is told to go dip seven times in the Jordan River and God will take care of his leprosy. He doubted it, right? Now we see water again. Verse 21, and this water symbolizes baptism that now what? Saves you also. Now that sounds ridiculous. And some people will say, that's ridiculous. No, it's not. It's scripture. That's scripture that says that. Right? What do we need to do? We need to believe. We need to believe in what God has commanded. Right? We need to accept it. And if we do that, we'll be cleansed. I hope today that some of you who are not in Christ, you'll realize that you can be cleansed. You can have all of your sins washed away. You've got to believe that Jesus is the answer. You've got to believe in him, be willing to turn your life around, confess him as Lord, be baptized, you can have your sins washed away. Just a few weeks ago, Susan did that. And we have a new sister in Christ because she did it. Maybe there's somebody else today, right? We'd encourage you. Uh, maybe you're in a desperate spot and you're ambivalent. You're like, oh, I don't really want people to know my stuff. Man, I'm not a mind reader. I don't know unless you let us know. We can't help you until you bring it out. People in this room can't help you until you start dealing with it. If you feel a need, you can come forward right now as we stand in worship.